טוב. Um, so today we're very lucky to be launching another program, um, which Pablo is also in charge of, which uh, is a very bright screen. Uh, so um, in front of you is a gentleman named Xiao Shen Wei, who is our first inaugural um, Intel Fellow. And so we met the gentleman from Intel a few weeks ago, actually, John Simone, who is responsible and, and kind of helping lead this program. The program sponsors a researcher here at CIAD to do um, work that we all arrive at kind of collectively, right? So it's the idea agenda, it's the intelligence and, and the personal research of the individual. Um, but it's a brand new program, so we're kind of building it as we go, typical CID sort of structure, out of non-structure. <laughs> um, but I think we did okay today. I think we, we had some nice chats. Um, and so we'll be, we'll be kind of uh, having different visits um, from Shashin Wei as he makes his way through the work. Most of the time, uh, most of the big slots will be over the summer. Mm -hmm. People who are interested in discussing um, setting up another meeting, for example, it's super good timing now to just grab them after the meeting and say, I'd like to talk to you when you come back, or that's the kind of, uh, the, I won't go through the details of when you'll actually be here, but there'll also be some workshops with some of the students, so you'll see um, the Shinwei again. I should say that this is, of course, part of um, something that I, that I was missing mentioning when John was here, is that, of course, this is part of something that is kind of a bigger program that Intel's put together. Uh, which is called the Design School Network, right? And so ourselves, uh, Carnegie Mellon University, California Institute of the Arts, the Pasadena College of Art and Design, and the Royal College of Art in London, got all those out without forgetting one, um, are all involved in this thing called the Design School Network. And it's a really amazing thing for CID to be involved in. Of course, those are all huge universities um, of a different sort than we are. You know, we're, we're kind of a, a small institute compared to those places. And so it's a great honor, and it's a great company. Uh, network and it's a great um, opportunity to have people like Shinway here. So just to be aware of that, um, and also you'll you'll notice that there's other little pieces of the pieces of that project besides the fellowship itself that will start to happen around the building. We're um, hoping to do a kind of a media platform for uh, both teaching and kind of research resources for interactive design researchers, other things, yeah, lots of other stuff. And this is all kind of basically through uh, through work with Intel. So it's been it's been great. I will hand over now to Shin Wei, who's going to speak. So Shin Wei is, uh, is just a, a recent transplant from Canada to the US. I'm sorry. Um, it, uh, it was based in uh, Montreal for a very long time. It founded something called the Topological Media Lab, which is something I've known about for as long as it's existed, I think. Um, so it's a, a, a great research center that was looking at intersections of uh, sort of media practices, but like also philosophy and mathematics, Shinwei's background in math. Um, there's a link also to our, our professor Gauthier, who you'll see next week, um, who worked with uh, Shinwei and was very incredibly excited actually when we, we ended up having you as a fellow. He was sort of like, that guy's my hero, and now he's like next to me on the people page at CID, you know? <laughs> um, so that's, that's, a, that's a big accolade uh, in itself for this community. Um, I, I guess I'll just leave you to, to introduce yourself. The other person that's in the building that we should all say hello to is uh, Chris Peter Wood, who is here from uh, the Media Arts Program at Queen Mary University, London, who will be a research resident associated with um, Shinwei's work. But uh, maybe I'll just stop there. I said a lot of stuff. That's great. Thanks, everybody, for coming. Thank you all for coming, indeed. I'm really delighted to, to begin to uh, introduce this project, but also uh, have a chance to maybe get to know some of you on this trip. I know time is probably too short, and one of the things that Jamie and Pablo and I thought about is that uh, this project may be really interesting in how it might have spin-offs, you know, or it might inspire a conversation between your projects and, and the work that we're doing. So really, it's a start of conversation done through objects and materials, as well as, as words, through the year. Um, you'll be doing your own work. So I'm happy to also talk with you about your work uh, as time goes on. Uh, uh, as Jamie said, we'll be here more continuously from, let's say, June, July, August in that time frame. I also have a day job. So uh, there's, the work is not just uh, two people, it's actually these people. Here, so I'd like to give credit already to some of the work that we've been doing for about a year, for about five years, I should say, 
I've been working with Nandit Nambar uh, in my lab, the topological media lab, and now he's one of the more experienced members of the lab, coming from the direction of electroacoustic music and real-time sound, sound processing, uh, gesture following, etc. So we don't. Well, we might be able to bring some of those people in during the year as well. Uh, for example, uh, Nadid and David were. Well, let's see, they're different time, different epochs. David was part of the lab about you know, maybe five years ago or so, or more before. Maybe more recently. Uh, and also Ona Ona Sutu. She's uh, uh, she's got like 19 years of experience as a documentary filmmaker. Worked with the Canadian NFB, the National Film Board. Uh, as a fairly established filmmaker, so uh, but she decided to come back to uh, pick up more, uh, more, uh, more practices from the domain of interactive media arts. So she's been working with me in the lab as well. And so we're very fortunate to have discovered Juan and I that we both shared a decades-long interest in paper. Uh, so she's been working more on the cultural side, cultural histories of paper, uh, the social histories of paper, going back to the beginning of paper technologies. So, so she's also a member of the team, and of course, most recently, Chris. And I think at some point we'll be talking more about, you know, Chris, is, Chris actually shares a lot of interest, for example, in sound, and actually with the prior background philosophy, probably shares also interest in the kind of the historical, symbolic um, aspects of this project. So today I'd like to just quickly go through some of those ideas for, like the ingredients for this project. This is just beginning, right? So these are ingredients. In fact, not all the people have met together yet. So um, just that. In the background, what I won't speak about, but just to underline what uh, Jamie mentioned, in the background there, there are several larger projects, one of which is a topological media lab. And I hope another time maybe I can come and talk about that kind of work. Uh, we'll see how to arrange that, because it may be interesting to think of that as kind of a substrate, uh, institutional substrate for some of this kind of work. Uh, I'm leaving that behind in Concordia University because there's good support, public support, and it's a really great you know, cultural ambiance in Montreal for keeping that kind of thing going with uh, Professor Michael Montanaro, who is the Chair of Contemporary Dance, and Professor Michael Morris, who is Chair of Philosophy. Uh, sorry, David Morris. And David Morris's background is in phenomenology. So we continue to do work together. And I'll build a new center in, uh, in ASU. And we'll have a guest um, from ASU here as well. So it's interesting connections going on all over the place. So um, first, first place, when I went to Stanford years ago to visit, uh, well, that was precursor to the D School talked with Larry Leifer, this was now 15 years ago, so I talked to some friends who were doing PhDs in design, and they were kind of moping around, and so they were really great as designers, and they're thinking, well, what are we doing making all these kinds of objects if they're destined for this? All right. So no matter how clever they were in making things, objects of all sorts, objects, 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 ultimately they're going to wind up here. So this whole, whole notion of innovation in, in, that they were looking at, for example, um, seemed to maybe miss the point. But why are they doing this kind of thing? This is kind of a, one of the many, uh, two or three slides of sort of putting things in question. One exercise I like to do, but it did stuff ahead of time, so sorry about that, is to ask people to take a large sheet of paper, like a Duncan experiment. There's the difference between doing it and thinking about it, first, right? So you take a large sheet of paper, fold it in half, and then take that and do it again. Take a large sheet of paper, this big, right? Fold it in half, as thin as you want. As thin as you want. Fold it in half, those of you that have, if you can try it. A half again, 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 again. See how many times you can do it. So before it gets really hard to do. Seven. Shot yet seven. Ten would be interesting. <laughs> ten would be, I would be impressed because you can sort of twelve. But it's shocking how few times it takes before it gets really hard to do. Yeah, two. Shocking. It doesn't really matter in the sense how big or how thin. Uh, so this is kind of a very concrete way to get us handled on what's called combinatorial complexity. Okay, it's exponential, right? It's exponential growth and complexity. And what's true for paper folding is true for everything. Everything that has to do with objects. You can try to start to try to manage complexity by categorizing objects into families of objects. So just kind of pushing the problem one step. All right. So this is a very quick way to go into a much deeper discussion about complexity and how I think really the question isn't really about complexity anymore, it's about richness. And I think those two are not the same. So this is part of a longer set of questions. I'm trying to give you some questions, negative and positive, that sort of came before the paper project. Like why do we get something like the paper project? So another kind of notion of things or objects is this picture maybe, well, so maybe some of you recognize this picture here. 
maybe. Oh, did you read so fast? <laughs> famous cover, a famous book, uh, Society of Spectacle, right? But uh, I usually, I don't think I show it here, I usually pair it with a, a really funny photo, a video of the early days of the Wecom shoulder, the, and then it shows, you know, a, 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 a man and his daughter, a little girl, uh, playing with the Wii remotes, and they're both looking straight ahead at the screen, right? They don't do anything with each other, just like parallel play, which is very funny. Parallel play usually is for babies, and they're like, whatever, two, three years old, but here's a grown-up and a, his daughter, they're kind of, quote, interacting by doing parallel play. <laughs> So a lot of these screening, screening technologies, in a sense, uh, this is too cartoonish, right? I'm being very cartoonish here, I'm being very blunt, okay, so it's not subtle, what I'm saying, uh, is that they tend to, these kinds of technologies might, might tend to atomize us. So we may be sitting in the same room, but while looking like this in parallel, so it's not really a social technology. It is a screening technology, it's a different kind of purpose. So these are kind of the, kind of the thoughts we've had over a couple of decades. So, okay, so maybe instead of thinking about the world in terms of what are the objects out there, what they see as people think of as ontology, right? This is different from what philosophers think of as ontology. Like, what are the basic kinds of things? There are chairs, there are creatures, there are plants and animals, etc. <clears throat> and manage complexity that way. What if we think first, the first starting point to think about is just that the world is made of stuff. Uh, and by world, uh, we could mean with Alfred North Whitehead, in a, take that in an unbifurcated, what he calls unbifurcated sense. And it's not a priori to decide, divide between you know, living and non-living, human and non-human, so, society and nature, all that kind of stuff, right? Let's not, let's first suspend those analytic di distinctions and just say the world is made of stuff. When I say the kinds of things, I'm not trying to be a philosopher or a scientist. I'm not saying this is really what the world is. It's more like a poet or a philosopher or a photographer. You have a certain point of view. Suppose to just go through the exercise of making stuff, talking about things, as if, right? It's just an attitude, and then see what happens, what ensues. So that's basically the big project behind the topological media lab, the book that I just came out with, etc. Thinking about starting starting from thinking about the world as made of stuff. This is really ancient. Really ancient, right? So it goes back to the pre Socratic still Parmenides and Jews, uh, Heraclitus, most famously, also see this in many cultures. Okay. So that's one, one way to start, and the positive way, right? After recognizing complexity, as we're recognizing the limits of the atomization that kind of object oriented ontologies give us, this is a strong critique of what's called object oriented ontologies, as some of you may have. Read or come across already, it's just becoming a fashion in, in literature and theory circles. Instead of that, it's also emphasizing that the stuff is always changing. So, we, we really, I always mean that things are always in movement, things are always changing. So, this is also not new, it's equally ancient as the current, which is what people in philosophy call process philosophy, right? So, going back to Heraclitus and going, coming, moving forward to Dr. North Whitehead, etc., or Deleuze and Guattari. So, instead of thinking about Objects, I would like to propose, we think about how objects transform. Don't deny that objects exist. We have institutions, we have cars that particularly make some models. But let's think, let's just, as, as, a, as an approach, why don't we think about transformations of objects? Like if you take, clear, it's clear in the sense of designing objects, but if you look at legal codes too, how do laws change over time? It's quite different in a Napoleonic code versus the way it works in an Anglo code, right? So being in Montreal, I was made acutely conscious of this when I was talking to my friends who went to uh, law degrees and, 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 and or practicing researchers in the law because in McGill University, they are taught both Anglophone and Francophone law. So it's very different kind of notion. So no time to go in there. But another, um, another concept this calls up is instead of thinking about making things, everything, every experience can be thought of as an event. Right? The same is true if you walk into an exhibition or a gallery. I said this in an MFA, MFA crits that I've been sitting on with amazing sculptures and, and, and people trying to marry technologies with, with, kinetic, with uh, sculptures or painting or installation art and say, well, there's, a, there's an experience. People walk into the room, where's your place, where's your first, what's the first object you want to see? What's the second one? And how's their attention going to change as they walk down the floor from one object to the next object to the next object? This becomes 
a scenographic question becomes a choreographic question. So the notion of events has become very useful to us. Another, then this begins to get toward the paper project, is instead of thinking about, um, let's say, the so-called form content divide, or, or thinking in terms of what is the image that's impressed onto the surface, uh, whether it's ink on the paper or something like an image on, on a surface like this, why don't we think in terms of the stuff of which things are made? So moving from things to the stuff of which things are made, so a convenient word, and these are just temporary words for that, right? I don't have the perfect vocabulary for it, just what you think, is to think in terms of maybe substrates, okay? So if you go to the engineers and say, well, we want to have a new technology for working with words, then we have this thing. We have HTML, we have SGML, we have et cetera, all these different kind of, uh, say, um, uh, um, uh, formal representational schemes for, for, for encoding language, I said words, or images, or 3D structures, or what have you. Those take a kind of a, a it's a machinic version of a formal approach to language, or linguistic description of, of, of things. You know, it could be graphic objects, it could be text objects, etc. But I would propose to really look at things in terms of subject, what they're made of. Um, and in fact, to take it back to pre-electronic and pre-digital days, look at ancient materials such as paper. So, so I think of you know when I took the original Canada Research Chair, the, the Canada Research Chair that I held for about eight years in Canada was called Canada Research Chair in New Media. And when I accepted it, I said, well, you know, I don't think it makes sense. First, I don't think there's such a thing as new media. This is like oxymoronic to say it's new media, but I'll take the job anyway. <laughs> so because I offered it, right? So I'll take it anyway. But after five years, I said, okay, I'll take it seriously now. I actually think that maybe yes, okay, let's really take the phrase new media seriously, but not in terms of computation. Not, not, not in terms of digital media, sorry. Not in terms of digital media. But in terms of just another turn, uh, what's been around for a long time, material science. So really extend the notion of matter now to material, which can include symbolic, physical, uh, analog, or corporeal, or, or computational. But the thing is, the challenge is to really take it seriously, meaning not just do a, um, not just do a metaphorical, allegorical thing, you know what I mean? Like you can, you can make a video of right, something, or you can describe it in words, but really, it's really, really hard to make what the MIT people call programmable backer. But then the problem with doing that is having some hard engineering, what you get is kind of a zombie of what I might mean by poetic material. Okay, so it's, 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 it's hard work, but what you might get by taking a purely technological route, you should get basically something that's just no more vital than, than, you know, than, than, than this thing right here. Let's say put it that way. So it's really hard to do the engineering. One thing we've been doing for 10 years or so is to really do the hard work in double E and pattern recognition, pattern tracking, et cetera, real-time continuous responsive media. Every single word is important. And we won't have time today to go into that. Those are some of the techniques now I'm trying to borrow, use the fruit of this work in this particular project for the paper. Okay? Another area is, of course, art. Another area, which is actually very important, is to really explore what we might mean by process <coughs> and event. So I'm just not, not much referencing here. I can always provide references later on if you want. <clears throat> uh, so I think for this thing, we can come back to this another time. But I already said some of this about really making it not just DIY, not just DIY techniques. This is quite different. This is quite a different take than most of the people working in this kind of area might, might do. <clears throat> this is what makes it a little bit ambitious, right? So that. You know, if we, if in order to manipulate the paper in a certain way, we might need to learn new kinds of mathematics, to, and then we think about new kinds of hardware, new kinds of software techniques. That's just deep work in the way in computer science. Right? It's not something we can just do with off-the-shelf stuff like Galileo board plus a bit of JavaScript or what have you. Okay, it's not that simple set. Okay, so it is more ambitious, but we can maybe, you know, in a year we can hopefully build some prototypes. I hope maybe some of you might be interested in playing prototypes and making other prototypes. Right, to give us a guy. Uh, what I mean, a modern Goethe's Mendelian science is that, um, hmm. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, 
Let's go back to the first slide. <laughs> uh, uh, it's really great stuff, but I'll have to read more time and talk about it maybe at dinner. Let me go with the first one. Art <laughs> all the way down means that this is people say this all the time, but it's really hard to do it. Is to you know just just talk about ideation and design center, design talk, and then you hit at some point hit at some point the line where we take the technology as given to us. You know, it could the line is always there. Right? It's going to be some point where, you know, I'm not a Harvard engineer, so I just take whatever process is given to me. Or, uh, you know, I, didn't, I, could, I could write a compiler, I've done it before, but I don't have the time to write a compiler for this custom language to do just anything. You know, like at some point, you hit the wall and say, okay, if we work on a collective form, though, right, if we have a collective, we don't have to, we can go all the way, all the way down. Right? If for good philosophical artistic reasons we say, no, we do not want to use a Turing machine, we should use water as a computing substrate. Then we should get a plumber, right? Or we get a garden designer. So we don't, that's why working in the art context has been very helpful, is that we can, we don't have to say that this kind of research needs to use this or that technology or this or that technique. This is an amazing group of people because you have that kind of freedom, right, as a collective. I mean, in this whole program set up. I was thinking more in conversation with Avi as well. I think it's the same idea have a kind of flexibility, which is Fairly, fairly rare, I think, in the world. Okay, so enough of that. We'll come back to that some other time. Okay. Anthropomorphic, notice the last slide with the non-anthropomorphic design. Part of this paper project is to move from like thinking about books and, and websites, etc., to looking at the stuff of which those things are made, right? I'll give you some example from just, you know, pre-modern time. Um, first, Talking about anthropocentric technology. Anybody have, has has anybody seen this chess plane? Seen pictures of this chess plane computer or automaton before? So the 18th century, early 18th century, called the Turk, T U R K, right? So it traveled the course of Europe, and it was this kind of device. It had some sort of like you know uh, automaton, mechanical, human-like figure. And you could play chess against it, and would mostly beat you, <laughs> because it was a very strong, amazingly strong chess player. This machine. This is like 1730 or 17, 1730s. It was very early, but it turned out after the original owner died, this is amazing, amazing history of automata. Like, how the hell could you make a machine like that? No, no computer, no electricity, really, no, no, right? So, it turned out after the original owner died, they discovered that it was powered by a dwarf. <laughs> <laughs> That's how it works. You put a human inside. <laughs> and I say that engineering of this kind of like AI, what have you, has not really advanced very much in deep ways in 300 years. Because it's still about putting yourself into the machine. All right. I mean, again, very you know, broad strokes. All right. But this, but this idea of, uh, it's, it's very strong, the idea of putting a proxy of yourself, you know, writing code. And so I'm embedding a bit of my agency into computers so that you can do it later, right? But what it does later is really kind of a, a mirror of some sort of what I would do if I were in this place. Of course, you can do it faster, et cetera, right? That's better memory than me. But this kind of anthropocentric design, in a very deep sense, deeply wedded, embedded in computers, is something that's not really not restricted to uh, engineering. So maybe a lot of you have seen this work or heard of this work. The series by Bill Viola. It's uh, The Passions. Anybody see this work or heard of this work, The Passions? It's, it's worth, it's worth, it's worth the work. Um, if you stand in front of it, I think it was shot in film uh, at some high rate, like 600 frames a second, a minute, and then transferred to video, high depth video, 24, something like that. So basically, very slow but no motion blur, beautifully shot. And shot, so it's lit from above, it's a bit like Rembrandt, and you start going to looking at portraiture, right? so the kind of model for his work during this period. Beautiful work, very powerful, and this is uh, a conceit after 9-11, so shooting uh, actors who are reenacting re moments of great emotional you know, uh, of, uh, attention. But still, it's all about me was all about us, homo sapiens. Or I like to say homo sapiens rex, you know? So the question for designers, for us, you know, makers, let's say engineers, uh, mathematicians, uh, artists, designers, 
To whom do you owe, or do you owe, or to whom do we owe, each of us, our allegiance? To Homo sapiens rex, or to the world? Because the way you answer this question, I think, has a deep impact on what you make. Okay. So, <clears throat> this is another uh, invitation to see if, we could, if it makes sense to think about non-anthropocentric, to take non-anthropocentric approaches to design, to science, to teaching, to any kind of making. All right? In other words, not to say to exclude the human, but to come up with ethics, for example, or environmental practices, what have you, that do not start from the given that is, we know what a human being is, and it's all about me, or all about us. Okay. This also underlies the paper project. So, implications. I already said this. Uh, uh, here we go. Okay, I'm going to end with this, this, this appeal to alchemy and make sure I come back to that. Okay? <laughs> what are some artistic resources? So there's been lots of prior work. Okay? It's, and I'm very, we're very fortunate to, to, to be bundling together some of the prior work. So one of them, for example, is work by Michel Fonderby, who is a, uh, teaches in architecture at Columbia University and is at Harvard once in a while. I met her at the Harvard GSD once. And she invited me to do a little, little essay for this ABC Darium on ink. So she's been very interested. In a sense, ink is a complement project to the paper project. Okay, but it doesn't involve computers, uh, really. And it's, it's, that's, that's a covered page. Well, that's the right hand has a covered page for the book. So she has these exquisite images of all sorts of uh, ways to think about ink, and then for which these little different essays are contributed by people. So I refer you to that project. I think of ink as, as I said, like a material playmate to the paper project. Another one, this is work by Navi uh, Navat, who I mentioned earlier. I'll just show you two videos, short videos, to give you a, a flavor of the kind of um, uh, sound instruments, real-time sound instruments that we can uh, have from the get-go. This is work with anybody here. Have, has anybody here done work with um, Earcom's software in Paris? They for gesture following. You probably seen gesture or emojis. Have you seen the videos from emojis? You can turn any object into an instrument. Okay, this shows you what we've done. Oops, uh, come back to the video. Here. He's a guitarist, also. So far? It's a sorry, question. Sorry? It's a what? It's a piece of mic. Yeah, it's a mic. 
Yeah, here's some mic. That one in particular has uh, some circuitry already yeah. onboarded to the noise. Yeah. Something like this could be easily done with the Makey Makey. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. There are also some ways to do it. What the, the, the interesting hard work there is underneath is um, to give you some idea. This is audio, right? So sampling at 44,000 44, frames per second. If you think about it, camera samples at, at best 24 frames, maybe for unlucky 12 frames per second, right? So oftentimes we do a lot of tracking work. Those of you, uh, you'll be doing this yourselves. If you do sensor work, uh, you know, if you're lucky with a connect, it's 100 frames per second, et cetera. This is 44,000 samples per second. Now, what he can do, what one, you, one can do, is that as you begin to touch that, that eggplant, you begin to make the stroke, you 30 out of, he, he, all he needs is 30 frames. It's 30 over 44,000. So it's a fraction of a fraction of a fraction of a second. And in that tiny window of time, you can tell how the hand is beginning to stroke the eggplant. And in that tiny window of time, you can reprogram the voicing of it. So depending on how you begin to stroke it, it can be laughter coming out, it could be water, it could be a tabla, it could be damp or not damp. So this extremely delicate word that's going on. There's a lot of programming underneath this. Okay, and also before that, a lot of math that goes on. You know, do the statistical analysis of the kind of gestures that are coming in the wire. So that's what I'm saying. Yes, of course, there's also the hard work to do it, but the real hard work is in this kind of very fine scale structure, the temporal textures of the touch. And then the fine scale analysis of what you do with that and how you do the mapping. So this is five years of work. And what I'm proposing is to bring some of those instruments out to here uh, and you know, hand them off to Chris and hope they can begin to play. And then we can think about the other parts, you know, what are the gestural topologies? What are the materials? You know, instead of egg plants, you know, what are the materials? Now, this is the next frame I'm going to show you, the next video I'm going to show you is everything put together into a performance. Okay, the paper project is not about making performances, but we have people who are also performing artists. So this is with, um, with Michael Montanaro, the choreographer, with a dancer, Tony Chung, who works with the Mary Chouinard. He's the principal dancer with the Mary Chouinard Dance Company in Montreal, and with Jerome Dallapier, who's a very accomplished video artist, same generation as Navid. Okay, this is just a trailer. <laughs> A lot of uh, cross media interlacing that's going on here. For example, he's lit, he's lit from the side by theatrical lights, so it's colored gel. So when you throw the powder up, this white powder becomes colored. The colorations can change in the DMX according to all sorts of logics, etc. etc. So, but we, we won't go into that. So now I'm going to show you uh, experiments that we have done in Montreal that pertain directly to the paper project. So I'm going to show you two series, very short. The first one is uh, done by, was based on the platform that Navid has built in Montreal. We hope to replicate the platform here, software, hardware, sensors, kit of papers, etc. cetera. Um, and, and right now we're exploring the gestural typologies we can play with. So, um, so the first question is basically, you know, if you have a given, if you're just sitting in front of paper and look, feeling it, how does its material quality affect what you do with it? You know, it's newspaper, newsprint, fine, you know, parchment, what have you. So Oana went through and did some tests. I'll just run through them quickly, give you a sense of the...
So where she starts from is here, the next one, in her own work. So bring the sound down. She has a box of letters that are 100 years old from her grandparents. And when they were sending love letters to each other, they're written in French, I believe. So the language, according to Alana, is extremely elegant. Uh, and she has this kind of, you know, treasure from, from her two, two generations back. So we're very interested, Oana and I are very interested in how paper is an obvious technology of memory. Works on the personal scale, but also obviously works on the scale of the archive. So history, to be, again, very, you know, synthetic, you could say history began with the invention of writing, and with Herodotus, etc. So history begins with the technology of writing. And one of the questions, in her project, um, the Adieu paper, is that does history end now with the, in the sense, the solution of paper into electronic media? I think it's a very interesting project. She's doing a documentary film project over the, it's been funded for the next three to five years. She should be working on that. So, but with Oana, I'm proposing that we go back to a more, let's say, phenomenological investigation. Is to think about, to think about the actual, you know, the felt experience of uh, manipulations of paper, okay? And all the different kinds of things you do with that made of paper. So it's before writing, in a sense, before the speech writing device. So thinking of the, the sound of paper, and she was deliberately using no computational media, right? We're just trying to get understand. The innocent the sounds are, quote, accidental, and that's a good thing, okay? We're not designing the sound to match the action. That would be closing off too much, okay? We don't want to go there right away. Sometimes they go there right away. And I kept saying, don't do that, don't do that. Don't design, don't program anything in MSP. Just do this, just do this. And we need a much broader range of activity. A much, much broader range. Do not get constrained by the, the techniques that we happen to have, even if they are sophisticated as the ones you've seen before. After having done that, then we can go to ways to associate recorded sound, live synthesized sound, or even more interestingly, live process. Like the processors then transmute whatever the sound is coming in through different kinds of acoustic pickups uh, in real time. And that's where we've done also a bunch of experiments. I'll just show you three different clips. Uh, the first one is with her son, six-year-old boy. Um, and he was, just, he was playing with it for 10 minutes. This is a world record for kids, 10 minutes. Okay. So in this first case, Adorable. Rosette. So um, he was surprised by the the contact mic was on the table, not on the paper. So we need to fix that. You know, just the paper. We also had an air mic, uh, like a lot of relay mic nearby. 
so of course they didn't pick up the sounds of the paper manipulation as well because contact micros on the on the on the paper itself, et cetera, et cetera. So then you went to a natural thing to do, which is take the accept the brush and start working on the paper, didn't pick up very much. Next, uh, in this case, Oana is using an invented alphabet and And there were various modules that had nothing to do with speech or language um, that were just producing live processing of sound input. We're just trying to write with a calligraphically, not typographically, with the sound. There's a lot to, to say about this, but in the interest of time, we're going to pass on. There's a lot, a lot, a lot to read out from this, these videos, actually. And we did a kind of a little analysis, like uh, fine scale, scale analysis of what's going on in, in her head as she's doing this kind of thing. The next uh, slide is um, a slide where she, she was trying to listen to speech and try to write, not to transcribe, but to write, uh, to just take the extract, the essence of writing without transcription. And the speech is reading out the original French letters, letters in French. Yes, there's, there's some speech. I'll show four. The last one is where we were also talking with erasure about erasure. So she was trying to play some games with overwriting, uh, uh, not writing on writing. You'll see. And they give you some idea of what's uh, the sensitivity here. The system is set up so that the instruments are so subtle that if you, like this, you're brushing with ink brush versus taking a fingernail across the paper versus taking a stylus on the paper, all those differences can be sensed by the system. It's a very fine acoustic analysis so that you can, you can load layers for sound into it. So if you were to scratch with a, with a pen, you get a certain voice, but if you were to then use your fingernail, you get a different kind of sound coming from the very same gesture, right? Or if you begin to brush with the same dynamics, you might hear something quite different, which is live processing of the sound. So it's very, very, I'm giving you a very, again, crude description, but you, I just want to give you a sense that there's a lot, a lot of delicacy and intricateness in how the acoustic data is actually used to modulate what you hear, okay? So this is, it could take a bulk of time, a fair amount of time, to really play. You can barely even literally scratch the surface of the richness of the correlation, modulation, of action to sound, okay? And we're not even working with paper sensors yet. That's kind of the, hopefully, the next couple of months working with Chris, we can begin to gain in-house expertise on embedding. I did this kind of work eight, nine years ago on my own as an amateur, but we may have access to some really master uh, artists from the, from the domain of, say, paper arts or fiber arts here in Copenhagen. So I'm very excited, thanks to Pablo, to see if we can make a connection with those people. All right? But embedding electronics into that, or transducers into paper to make sounding paper, which is part of this project. Okay. Um, questions so far? I'll, I'll wrap up pretty soon, but any questions so far on the videos? Okay, we'll go back to turn the lights and then people can say.
So basically, in terms of technical resources, some of the more, um, I'm not going to take time today to talk about some of the technical stuff too much, um, but we already know that we're talking about gesture following. So there's a lot of work from pattern recognition or rather pattern following researchers in computer science and electrical engineering. A lot of interesting work has done, been done at IRCOM in Paris, in the Centre Pompidou, Pompidou, and at Karma at Stanford, and also at, um, at uh, McGill's Center for Music and Technology, Kermit. Uh, so we have, active, my lab has active relationships with those people, and I hope to bring some of those relationships here to, to CID. Another domain, which is, uh, this is <coughs> fancy words for very simple thing, just embed sensors into paper, but custom, custom made papers. So we'll get our hands wet, literally. Uh, I know that works because I've done it myself, and all sorts of interesting things, but there's also gotchas, so you can go down to try. Uh, next thing, which we haven't done, I haven't done myself, I know people have done it, but I would love to get into that, is putting transducers into the paper. Hannah Perner Wilson, there you go. Hannah Perner Wilson is coming. This, uh, you are very lucky to have someone like that come in to do a module with you. Um, she also trained or studied with, worked with uh, one of my PhD students, Adrian Free, who is the research director at, at CINMAT, the Center for New Music and Technology at Berkeley. Adrian is also a member of my lab in Montreal, doing a PhD, but he also is kind of the person who she worked with when she was at Berkeley, then she went to MIT, and now she's touring the globe and coming here. So pretty nice connections. The thing is that she's a master inventor, and she's one of these people who's got an exquisite sense of the potentiality of materials, materials, right? And then combining with, with, uh, with uh, electronics. So you're very lucky to have her here, and I would love to intersect if possible with, with them. Um, then there's also the question of paper. So another time, we'll say more about the Q. This part is called Q is for quickening. And why is it called Q is for quickening? It's because it's another project uh, where I wrote a little, little essay about alchemy. And it's for a friend of mine, Mark Sussman, who's been in, in theater working with puppetry. So Mark and I have a long interest, have had a long interest about animating inanimate objects. Puppetry is one of the ancient, ancient uh, uh, domains where this, this is done very well, right? So, so as you can begin to see, a lot of techniques we're doing in the approach that we have in topological media lab is to look for far, far, far away from the computer to look for ideas that have been tested and used for thousands of years, and then see where some of that magic, so to speak, or rather alchemical work, can take a new life inside the computation. All right? But there's just one computation, just one little tool adjoining all these other tools that we've had for centuries. That's the basic approach. Okay. So Q is for quickening, because quickening, the word quickening, has to do with, if you know some, uh, you, know, to, you know, the quick in the dead is a phrase we use in English, right? Or to quicken, you know, the ancient use was for when um, the two senses, right? One is when the woman is pregnant and the first quickening of life, the moment that you first feel the fetus inside the belly is the moment of quickening. And another sense of quickening is the quickening of water, or the quickening of, uh, of stuff. So light begins to appear in inanimate material. Right? So all these senses of quickening are what we have in mind when it's all about this kind of thing. And that has to do with, for instance, it's not about the word of God, or about the word semantics and cognition. It has more to do with what Guattari would call the asignifying semiology. So I'm, just, I'm writing lightly, but underneath there's a lot of interesting discussion and thought been going for the last hundred years about the limits of language and the limits of representation. So in the, in the greatest seminar that I do back, in, back at Concordia and now in ASU, we start with the reading of Wittgenstein's critique of language and representation in the philosophical investigation. So we take it very seriously. And first, just look at the limits of representation and then set it aside and go to the question of, is there such a thing as kind of a, what he called it? What really called a signifying semiology. I'm just putting these bullet points because I know some of you also have shared interests. I would love to talk with you more about that aspect as well as with Chris, with you as well as with Chris. So politically with Oana, when you come to Oana, another there are different kinds of histories, just kind of archive and history of society and civilization, big, big scale. It's also kind of maybe like a humble but poetic scale. That paper is born in water and it dies in fire. Not that it in, inevitably dies in fire, hopefully. Well, in the sense it always does, actually, because paper oxidizes. So yes, all right? Paper is always born in water and dies in fire. So how can we play with that? This kind of, this kind of theater, so to speak. It's a kind of art, poetic art, 
of life of paper. It could be over 500 years. Um, from Oana's her, her own study, she, she remarks that we have these accumulations of paper over centuries. And inevitably, this is her story, is that when we have these great archives, like the Alexandria Library, or in China during around 200 BC, uh, with the burning of the books by Qin Shi Huangdi, the first emperor, right? we have this kind of conflagration that resets the clock, that just burns human knowledge, all that human knowledge was encoded in paper, or, or held in paper. And in the digital era, what we claim, what, what we think we see, is again the kind of conflagration. This is a kind of poetic slash social technical point. We have a conflagration of material recording of our memory. So all this, all this um, talk about preservation of new media, preservation of digital media, kind of the anxiety about that, right? So we, so it's an interesting discussion. So this engages in that kind of discussion of what, where is the archive now, right? So that's kind of fire as well. And finally, uh, people to quickening. I mentioned already, quickening has a set of um, ancient senses. It also has a sense in terms of alchemy, because alchemy was, and here I'll close, alchemy had this notion of, uh, I'll make a distinction between alchemy and sorcery, all right? Sorcery or magic is where I am the magician. I am the human version of God. I command these things to do things, right? The sorcerers are printed, so I make this, I command you to carry water for me, right? So I have a kind of relationship to the world as somebody who deals with special knowledge and special power. Alchemy, I suppose, is different. First of all, an alchemist is somebody who studies the world. What is, what's the world made of? What kind of stuff? You say the world is made of stuff. So what is the stuff like? How does the stuff behave? What is computational, symbolic, material? And then the alchemists would try to understand, in a sense, that kind of uh, essence and see if he or she can make a quintessence out of the essence, a deliberately mixing ancient language from alchemy. All right? So it's a very different relationship to the world than the magician or sorcerer. Okay. Clearly, I'm not speaking as an anthropologist. In fact, I'm deliberately not, because I actually don't agree with certain kinds of anthropological exterior version of alchemy. I'm trying to take it seriously right? as a practice in the a modern sense, which includes contemporary practices as well as ancient practices. I'm deliberately using terms from Bruno Tour and Isabel Stengers, for those of you who are interested. Okay, this question, this notion of a modern. Okay. And so it's an orientation, it's an approach to technology. It's an approach to not things or objects, so to speak, that's where I differ from the tour, okay, and differ from the object oriented people, but to really take a point of view of stuff. Second is that it's also the actual essay itself. It's a little poetic thing. It pays homage to Chris Marker and to uh, to uh, um, Yogi Legati, for example. And these are the kinds of uh, little thoughts I want to bundle together into a form of like a text, which could become the material for an actual produced work. And that would be just a starting point with my collaboration with Chris, Navi, and um, Oana. So I think that's it for the, the blah blah part. But I would love to to to. Have your questions. Thank you very much. Are there lights? Can I have more lights? Okay. Comments? Questions? Thank you very much. Yeah. Any questions? I can well maybe we can have a comment and a question just yeah. inspired by the six videos that you had in the little montage. You made me think about how we associate different kinds of value with different kinds of paper. Value? And, yes. Mm -hmm. And it's not just about the, the quality of the paper itself, but the reason for which it was written. Um, so just taking the written word, not thinking about any form of art or anything like that. But how the, the letters on the right-hand side, obviously they're very emotional. And they've been written from someone to someone, and they've been kept for a reason. And it would be almost kind of blasphemous to destroy those on purpose, as it would to rip out a page from a book, which uh, you know, mm. people have different <laughs> different feelings about. Personally, I hate that when you get a book and someone is just um, carelessly taking a, a page from the book. And yet on the other side, just an empty sketchbook you can rip a page from because there's, there's nothing on it. So I'm just wondering, it's not a question, but yeah. a general wonder, yeah. what kind of value yeah. giving audio 
um, this is a discussion, right? So something can just become yeah, for me. But this is a great, uh, this is why we're doing this exploration in the gesture side, rather than diving into this or that technique or sonifying, what have you. So first, let's understand what are the commitments, the ethical relationship one has with the material and with implied subjects, blah, 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 with all these playful activities. And then we'll get to design, does sound work or not. It, and also, we say sound now because instead of, we could all imagine images can change on the paper too. Right. Setting aside the obvious things, which is technically it's much harder. Okay, but I'm thinking about that for the next version of this project. Yes, but more importantly, is what Ali just mentioned is, um, I think sound has a way to permeate, literally permeate all matter. Right, because it's really just a matter of oscillation, just vibrations. So there's no way to block sound, so to speak, very easily. That's actually very interesting. So that means I can put the paper on the table, I can knock on the table, I can scratch on the paper, and as long as they're touching, it goes through, right? I can pick it up. And if my hand is touching the paper, touching is the key thing, then whatever I do with my fingers goes through too, passes through. So this fact, this, ob this obvious fact, okay, makes it very different working with sound versus working with visual. Because visual, you can have, quote, action at a distance. Right? I can see somebody without touching that person. I can also have this problem, so to speak, of occlusion. If something's behind this hand, is not visible, as visible as this front hand. Right? But sound is quite different. Sound permeates the whole our world, our, our, our experience of the world. So that's part of the thing about thinking about stuff, right? about thinking about what is separate objects. So that's why sound, we chose to go with sound. When you, when you first said that, it made me think, of course, of money, right? Like the actual mm -hmm. paper of money. Mm -hmm. Because all these, a lot of the examples, of course, are very, the letter writing and the romance of letters, and the, the, of course, like, I just wonder if part of this investigation could be something of the kind of, paper also enables bureaucracy and power, and, um, you know, um, uh, literacy is a way of keeping people subjugated, yeah. and, you know, there's, there's a lot of interesting sort of <clears throat> power dynamics, like, in, you know, you can have insurance or policing yeah. or, the law, absolutely. Without the written words, yeah. absolutely. Or without paper, actually, just the physical paper. That's why I mean, Christian mm -hmm. brought this up with the notion of uh, the mandatory instruments. It's, it's, quite, it's quite political. It's absolutely, for sure. This is very rich. Please. I'm curious about why you chose paper as, as such a central medium. For example, you touched a bit on the idea of paper maybe being on its way out as you know a physical medium. But for example, so, you know, human memory has been encoded in verbal storytelling before, and you know, it's now being encoded in many different ways. So why is paper so important? Well, and it's not for me to, I'm not saying about myself, right? There are lots of things. Important to you. Yeah. But, but, um, but it's interesting to think about this. I, I mentioned, I don't think I mentioned the names, but a very good reference for this would be like Walter Ong, O-N-G, kind of like the main go-to person for talking about orality versus literacy. And he writes very well about this, uh, literacy and orality. And also people, namely Illich and Sanders, I-L-I-C-H and Sanders, that's the N-T-E-R-S. Um, you can play that back later <laughs> in the recording. Uh, who've written profoundly about um, oral culture versus literary culture, the culture of writing and text. Not so much paper by itself, but writing in the this way of fixity. So, so this is on the back of our minds when we're talking about paper as kind of the most like the industrialized substrate for recording written language. Let's put it that way. <coughs> also some other ways like chiseling stone, whatever. So with industrialization as kind of substrate, then naturally it's the most the first thing we would look at. It's not about substrate. It's substrate to writing. Okay? Because that writing is in a sense behind all this. For two thousand five hundred years in the West, it's from you know Plato <laughs> from the Phaedrus to the present, it's writing. Writing is how we have a collective memory of what we did centuries ago. Okay? And in terms of diaries, journalistic thing, writing is just even a sense of personal identity. A lot of people, you know. Paper is a material substrate because paper allows us to think about the... I think that's where the fixity of the writing comes from, is the fixity of the material substrate. Because Derrida did famous work on a mythological project about describing what he called the fixity or iterability of the written sign. Okay, so from literary theory, we have a lot of deep, deep work since Derrida about the grammatical, the difference between speech and writing. Okay, deep, deep work. But I'm taking a more humble look. It's, ah, let's look at the stuff on which these signs are written. Okay, and well, where does some of that fixity come from? 
simply the fixity of matter, you know, paper. It could be stone, like I said, but I'm just using paper because it's industrially the most common material for fixing signs. Okay, that's kind of the why my paper from a practical, you know, what's the, the material for doing stone experiment? This paper. We could choose other media, but I need something which is durable. Durable. Yeah. Durable. Please. Um, what do you think? I mean, now we're in a time where a lot of people use ebooks instead of half books. Mm -hmm. So, what do you think the future of paper is? That's the big question. Uh, Intel has sponsored a project at my school called The Future of the Book. And it's not just at ASU, it's, it's a global, they have a group that's interested in the future of books, okay? And they're interested in, you know, taking over the, from Kindle, right, that kind of thing. Uh, and the tablets and saying they want to put in the kind of the, the, the framework for encoding all kinds of ebooks, right? Which would be great, actually, I think. It'd be great to have kind of less, well, okay, replace one smaller proprietary system by a larger proprietary system, okay, let's put it that way. In any case, uh, that's their, that's one of their strategic projects, and we are, my, my schools has faculty involved with that. I see this as complementing that, all right, in both those kind of paper versus book thing, because paper is what books are made of, so that by analogy, then we want to find e-books should be made of e-paper, right? It's very simple logic. So what's e-paper gonna be like? So we have companies like Eating been working for what twelve years or so since they started at MIT. Uh, I've been tracking that for a while. So that's all the techie side of things, right? But here's another way to think about it. Um, when I went to New York to Harvest Works a few years, a few six years ago or so, there was a panel discussion with with well-established media artists, you know, like Lynn Hirschman or uh, Cap Jim Campbell, etc. And they were all talking about, with museum curators from New York and other cities, about media arts. And museums, as you know, are very leery of collecting media art. Because after 10 years, operating systems go, the machines are never <coughs> not, not used anymore. So how are you going to keep an object like that? Because it's not a good investment to least institutional money to invest in media art. When I went to ZKM about six years ago, and a lot of the signature works by people like Jeffrey Sh uh, Shaw and Bill Viola were not working. They were dark because machines were not, you know, couldn't be maintained. So, so there was all this discussion, right? And then I thought, at that point, I thought and made this comment, I think, which I think is still useful, is that instead of comparing digital media to paintings and sculpture and stone monuments, like we talk about preservation, right? Why don't we compare it instead with speech? That is, when you, when you, you do anything in Photoshop, Final Cut, what have you, that's a digital medium, right, like that. What if we think about that more like a kind of speech? Speech evaporates in milliseconds, bounces off those walls, through your bodies, and it's gone. Right, it's gone. Except in your memories, of course. With computer media, it reverberates around the planet, maybe for 10 years, if we're lucky, maybe 20. All right, the formats will change. I have code written, everybody has it. I have code written back in the 1980s, which I cannot even compile. The compilers don't exist anymore, right? When Apple went from OS 9 to OS 10, those things broke and quit off in a simulation <laughs> mode, for example. So for sure, and you all have this. We have tapes, uh, optical drives, you know, what have you, and those media formats change. So, it's a, so instead of fighting that, why don't we just think of these as forms of extended speech? And then it's, it's miraculous because this is speech that reverberates for years and years and years instead of fractions of a millisecond. And more, we can modulate that speech. We can write other code that transforms it as it passes through your computer or through your body. So it's, a, it's not really speech as it was known before computer. So now it's a new kind of, of um, time-based articulation. And that's a very interesting terrain, very, very different. So this paper project also engages in that. We just don't need a keyboard. We don't need WIMP, we don't need mouse, we don't need menus. We directly, you know, manipulate paper, we're directly sounding paper. So it just cuts out a lot of layers in between. Cuts out the notion of the interface, of the WIMP interface. Cuts out the notion of grammar and linguistic structure. Cuts out even semantics, in a sense. So to go directly to body, stuff, sound. So that's part of the quick project. Uh, I was curious about uh, 
like I, in the sonification part that you showed in the later part of the presentation, um, uh, the way the, the the gestures are mapped to certain soundscapes, and because sound is such a powerful medium for evoking emotions, uh, what what were some of the mappings that were going on, or is there some kind of a thought in that? <coughs> That's a whole talk. Yeah. Um, uh, do we have a a media choreography system called Ozone? In that we built in whole libraries of software instruments that do real-time processing of acoustic data and is modulated by blah 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 parameters and put that sound. Similarly in video, and also similarly mapping it to DMX or lighting control, or what have you, for the whole theatrical apparatus. So it's been 10 years times five people, 50 person years of work. Right? In that, Naveed, who I showed, is one of the current prominent sound artists doing that work, and well, there's a lot of you working on sound, Chris himself, right? In that, okay, there's, there's like, like five or six categories of techniques. One of them that you're hearing is what's called concatenative, I've never pronounced it, concatenative synthesis, mm -hmm. CSPC. Uh, so currently, that's in the sound world, that's one of the most popular ways. Why? Because you basically take grains of sound from some corpus. This corpus based concatenative synthesis, C, B, C, C, S. You can take grains of sound from some nature, you can go out sampling. You cut on little pieces, but then it does extremely intricate grain by grain feature analysis. And the feature is you can define your own features. You can write your own code to do custom feature analysis. Then you take a target sound. And so like, you know, those, those you know, <laughs> uh, mosaics, sound mosaicing, audio mosaicing. You can sort of um, take this kind of prefab alphabet of grains, put them together, and grade the target sound. That's boring. It, it's too, it's a, a technical gene, but it's boring. What's interesting is you can modulate that. They can begin to put some, you know, like speech like features into water. They make water talk, but you can't hear the speech. You hear that it sounds like a human voice in the water, stuff like that. That's one of the four or five different large bodies of techniques he's got going. In there. Okay. There are other techniques, but this is one. Please, questions? Yeah. This is a small technical provocation. Like it, it does stay in the sonic world. The, the the loop in a way that like you've shown all these examples of um, are sampling at audio rate into an audio card and then unless I'm mistaken and then outputting into the sonic landscape and again I'm just curious if there's a way to think about um, sort of infra infra signals that are also coming mm -hmm. from from the same substrate like mm -hmm. as a, I don't know what that would be to be honest like subsonic yeah. ultrasonic whatever yeah. and then just thinking about um, because why, why would we limit ourselves just to that single loop, right? It's, not a, it's kind of arbitrary to the equipment. And yeah. yeah, we don't have to, we don't have to. I just, you're absolutely right. We don't have to, it's just a place to start because after 10 years of experience, it's really kind of like, we've tried a lot of different things over 10 years. We tried all sorts of sensing technologies. We've built our own sensing. We, Intel seeded us with, in, in 2004, <coughs> with their um, uh, uh, tiny OSC, which is from Berkeley and Intel. You know, there's a wireless, Platforms for sensor platforms and with the custom voice, blah blah blah. blah. We build our own sensors, and overall, and we do camera tracking. We do we do work with microprint paper, blah, blah blah. And it seems like right now this is kind of the kind of the most bang for the buck. So that there's so much nuance and so much gesturality that we can pick up from a microphone, which is not used for audio but for vibration. I sampled at 44,000 samples. There is no other sensor technology available to us. Mm -hmm. Commercially, in our budget range, we can sample at 45,000 samples per second. We've been looking at phantom cameras with sample rates of you know 10 to 100,000 frames per second, but they're out of our budget, mm -hmm. for example. And also, the camera has this occlusion problems with the light is seen with a huge amount of light to be able to get enough light to do the analysis. And I have a lab in the issue, we can do that. So, there are all sorts of practical um, reasons we can do this, um, which are interesting, but I'm certainly interested in other sensing modalities mm -hmm. for sure. Absolutely. I'm thinking of some local partners, actually. Absolutely. It would be very interesting to do that. Absolutely. So we're It's also, I mean, the, the answer sometimes is, uh, or not that I've asked that question to anyone before, but, the, you know, there's something ontologically that's interesting about this, the sound. Yeah. You know, like when someone says, the, the, like, in the news lately, like, you know, something about the sound of Venus, <laughs> the sound of Venus has been recorded, right? Like, what the hell does that mean? Yeah, it has a vacuum sound. between here and there, so yeah. there's no way you're listening to that planet. Yeah. Um, and so... <laughs> But somehow we accept that. Mm -hmm. like the, this, the voice of that thing mm -hmm. is somehow okay to be yeah. talked about. 
And so an object sort of having a voice makes sense in a way. It does yeah. speak. Or... Now we go into the poetic reasons why I look for the sound. I thought that might be your answer. There are two. There are poetic reasons and ethical reasons. The ethical reasons has to do with politics of touch, which I just touched on just like 10 minutes ago. And I would love to talk more about that. And that's kind of a profound reason. And then the poetic reason is what you just said, is this thing about voicing. Mm -hmm. But also, in a more phenomenological reason, it's a question of rhythm. So rhythm, we're studying this back in the workshop right now. It's happening in ASU in Phoenix. We're doing a three-week workshop on temporality, your sense of change, dynamic rhythm. And another parallel series of research workshops on um, transition, the sense of something is changing in around us meaning collective sense of that, individual sense, and machine sense, machinic perception of change. Okay, so we're doing this kind of work in our rebuilt responsive environment stuff, which you should all come visit someday. Um, it's theatrical scale, big black box scale. In there, rhythm is super interesting, because rhythm, I just, if you look at this, obvious, we learned some one-on-one -on -one design, right? Visual rhythm, here we are, look at it. Or rhythm on the floor, or rhythm on you know, the, the code lack of rhythm, which kind of texture here, feature, so called feature this table. There's, there's, uh, there's, kind of a, there's kind of auditory rhythms, right? Versus this, right? Um, but what's interesting about what I just did here is rhythm is not modal. It's not modal. It's not just what you see or what you hear, you know? I mean, I can get a sense of a rhythm by all sorts of sense modalities and sensor modalities if you're working as, a, as an engineer. I can look at the scene, do computer vision, you know, do the map, or I can use acoustic pick up and get this kind of, this push rise and this thing, right? But really what's going on is, is, it, is irregularities or regularities of stuff, in this case, brick, and it's a human body moving with respect to that stuff. Together, they generate a temporal texture, right? That's a phenomenal, not a perceptual, but a phenomenological sense. It's, it's in between this. You can get to it through senses. You can only get to it through senses. But it's a phenomenological sense, mm -hmm. right? Rhythm is not a perceptual sense. It's a phenomenological sense. It's an experiential sense. This takes a bit of thought to get to it. <coughs> and it's profound, OK? It's really interesting. So to us right now, that's why we're focusing on rhythm. Mm -hmm. yeah, because to us, it's the substrate to how we feel coupled to the world and to each other. Mm -hmm. That's what we think. So that's that's precisely like what the sound of Venus evokes, right? Like yeah. You know it. You sort of know the planet in some other way, but it doesn't make any yeah. sen sen sensual sense at all. Absolutely. Absolutely. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you very much. Okay. <laughs>